Hey guys, this video is going to look at the concept of training principles. Have you ever walked out of a classroom and thought, wow, that class was just not for me. I feel like I didn't do a whole lot of learning in there. Well, that could be because of a whole bunch of factors. Maybe you're not interested in the subject, the content was too hard, or maybe you've just come back from holidays and you've lost a bit of brain power. Don't worry, it'll come back. Well, the principles of training that we're going to cover make sure that athletes walk out of each training session having accomplished a thing or two and made the most of their time. So make sure you check out those points below and today we're going to look at the purpose of the principles of training and then we'll go into some key principles including progressive overload, specificity, reversibility, variety, training thresholds and the warm up and cool down. Okay, so training for a sport is all well and good, but if the programs aren't tailored to meet the specific demands of the athletes and their sport, then you can bet your bottom dollar that athletes are not getting the most out of their sessions. So the principals help them by making sure their training sessions are tailored to specific requirements. They are training at the right workload and rest periods are timed correctly. If athletes use all of these principles, then they will see bigger improvements at a faster rate than if they were to simply start exercising with no direction. So let's jump into these principles. Our first principle is progressive overload. They say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Well, whoever said that knew a thing or two about progressive overload. This principle is about gradually increasing the exercise load an athlete undertakes in order to see continuous improvements. Our bodies are incredible things. They adapt very quickly and if the frequency and intensity of training an athlete does remains constant, their body will catch up to this workload and halt any further adaptations. So in order to see different and better results, athletes must alter their workload. For aerobic training, this might mean an increase in duration or distance of training, whereas for resistance training, this might mean higher reps or an increased weight. Next, we have specificity. If you were studying for a maths exam, would you sit down and write a history essay? No, that would be of absolutely no benefit to you. The same goes for sport. Athletes have to train specifically to the energy system and skill requirements needed for their sport, and even their position if they play a team sport. For an aerobic athlete, such as a long-distance cycler, this would mean training for longer periods of time with no breaks and focusing on muscular endurance, particularly in the legs. For an anaerobic athlete, such as a 100-metre sprinter, this would mean training for shorter periods of time more intensely and focusing on specific muscle groups, again, such as the legs. Alrighty, our next principle of training is reversibility. You all would have experienced it. It's what happens when you go on holidays from school and come back and your brain feels like mush and 2 plus 2 starts equaling 5. For athletes, it's the loss of adaptations that they gained during training because of a prolonged break period. Basically, Use it or lose it. This principle happens when an athlete is injured and has to take time off training or at the end of a season during the recovery period. Adaptations tend to be lost at a similar rate to which they were gained. So gaining three kilos of muscle in two weeks means this muscle would be lost very quickly if training stopped. Aerobic adaptations tend to be lost within four to six weeks, but this can be somewhat prevented with two minimal intensity training sessions a week. Anaerobic adaptations are lost at a bit of a faster rate within one to two weeks, but again can be slowed down by training just once per week. Okay, so next we've got variety. This principle serves two purposes. Firstly, it prevents boredom and keeps athletes engaged and motivated to train. Secondly, it ensures they are training holistically. This means that every muscle group or fitness component is covered and different muscle groups and energy systems are given a break. So aerobic athletes would alternate between different aerobic training methods. Simply running for 30 minutes every session would cause disinterest and limited improvement. Similarly, 
anaerobic athletes would alternate between different anaerobic training methods. Now let's dive into training thresholds. These are simply the zones at which athletes need to train if they want to see improvement and adaptation in the necessary energy system. So basically, aerobic and anaerobic athletes have to train at a different percentage of their maximum heart rate to see improvements. Quick note, one way to simply calculate your max heart rate is 220 minus your age. So if aerobic athletes like our marathon runners want to see improvements in their cardiovascular system performance, they have to train between 60 to 80% of their maximum heart rate. If they train below this point, they'll see no improvement, but above it, they will be training in the anaerobic zone. The anaerobic training zone is at 80 to 90% of maximum heart rate. Again, this is where our sprinters, weightlifters, etc. will be training. Below this, they'll be in the aerobic zone, but above this isn't ideal either. Above 90% of maximum heart rate, something happens called the onset of blood lactate accumulation. Basically, it's where the lactate starts forming in the muscles and athletes fatigue super quickly, so they cannot train for long enough for adaptations to occur. And of course, training at the higher end of each zone just under the thresholds is where most adaptations occur. The final principle that we need to run through today is the warm-up and cool-down. The warm-up happens for about 20 minutes at the beginning of each session, and there's two key phases. The first is general warm-up. This is where athletes generally increase the heart rate, respiration rate, and prepare the muscles for the anticipated demands of the session ahead. Doing this means athletes will be able to move faster and more powerfully, so again, getting the most out of these sessions. Then we have specific warm-up. Here, athletes have to perform movements that are super similar to those that they have to do in the session. So for example, a netballer could run around the court for the whole 20 minutes, or they could do some grapevines, lunges, and tuck jumps to get the mind thinking about those movements from the get-go. The cool-down simply lowers all of the things we raised in the warm-up, the heart rate, respiration rate, etc., and is super important to prevent injury and prepare the athlete for the next session. It also prevents DOMS, delayed onset of muscle soreness, by removing all built-up lactic acid that accumulated in the training session. And that's it for today, guys. Let's have a quick recap before you sign off. So today, we looked at why in heck we actually care about the principles of training. They give training sessions a direction and a focus and ensure athletes are making the most improvements possible. Then we dove into the principles and looked at progressive overload, specificity, reversibility, variety, training thresholds, and the warm-up and cool-down. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time.